having a swig of his early morning booze. <laughs> How do we know that's not vodka, huh? Huh? How do we know that's not vodka? That's Will Durst, ladies and gentlemen. How you doing, everybody? It's good to see you. It's a little early for me, but it's good to see you, you nonetheless. Well, you you like to do this at nine in the morning. You know, for a comedian, you get up awfully early. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I'm I'm a kind of a writer or something, so I don't know. Uh, it just seems like I have to get up yeah. and do something. Yeah, yeah. So, how have you been? Uh, more vodka. Uh, how have you been? Uh, went to, uh, let's see, we went to spring training. Yes, to, and how was the, it? After the last time we talked to you, and then we came home for a week. And then last week, we went to Vegas, and we saw Hall and Oates, Daryl Hall and John Oates. And then we saw the Beatles Cirque du Soleil love thing, which was really good. Y yeah. And, uh, and, and did you, did you... So we've been on two little trips, Arizona and Las Vegas. You know, Pearl is living in Vegas. Yeah, that's what I hear. Yeah. I hear he's doing well. So you didn't... Steve Kravitz just moved there, too. Kravitz moved there? What is it? Mm -hmm. all, all these comics are... It's like becoming the uh, the Miami for comics. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What can yeah, I say? I think you're right. Uh, anyway, uh, how... Uh, you know... How have uh, you been? I've been okay, you know. I can't. Uh, I can't complain. I mean, I should. I can complain, but that's my nature. Oh yes, you can complain. Yes, but I. But basically, compared to other people I know, uh, I'm doing okay because they're dead. You know. So. Yeah. Yeah. I just had another friend die on me. You know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is what happens when if, if I said, "Why do Why do I have so many people dying on me?" And the answer is because I've lived to be this old. <laughs> yeah. You know, if I hadn't lived to be this old, all these people wouldn't be dying. They'd all be saying, why, "Oh, Alex, did you hear about him? Why?" Yeah, so many yeah. people I know who are dying because uh, anyway. It, be another I'm, example. It's a mitzvah. I should just say, hey, well, another one's gone, but I'm still here. <clears throat> you know? Lament their passing. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I think that's why it's important that we that we do acknowledge the fact that people are are moving on. Yes, yes. And and I went moving on. It's like, yeah, they rented their van and went to Nevada or something. Well, I went to a memorial the other day for uh, for a guy who died, just recently died. Uh, worked with me on Midnight Blue years ago and used to call this oh. program uh, uh, rather frequently uh, named John Watt Rockwell. And uh, they held a memorial for him in a bar that he used to like to frequent. So, uh, Is he a New Yorker? I, yeah. 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 So that I, makes sense. Yeah. So I, I went to that and uh, uh, met up with an old friend. Basically, there was only one person there I knew. I mean, because all the other people were his friends and these were not people I knew. Because I, this guy worked with me, what, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, something like that. Midnight Blue? Midnight Blue, yeah. Yeah, that was the late 70s. Yeah, yeah. So, that was 40 years ago. As if, well, sh shut up. Shut the <laughs> fuck up. Everybody always corrects me. Oh, no, that was 40 years ago. Oh, really? Oh, thank you very much, you know. So well, the only guy I was there, so impressed when you came to town with Midnight Blue because I had heard about Midnight Blue. Yeah. Yeah, because I was doing documentaries in Milwaukee, and Midnight Blue was, you know, it's this underground, it's cutting edge, it's uh, the top of uh, what is happening today in terms of video. Yeah, and then uh, yeah. Well, yes, it was, and if I have to, uh, you know, people always come up to me every now and then in an interview or something and go, "And you did this Midnight Blue in New York," and, you know, and I go, "Yeah, I did," and I, and then I tell them that of all the things I've done in my career, that's the thing I'm singly most proud of is Midnight Blue. Well, it broke so many barriers. Yeah, well, I mean, I did something that hadn't been done before, right? And and I think that's important, you know, and I broke barriers in, in what we were then calling television and now we just call video. Uh, and uh, so I'm very proud of that achievement. Uh, yeah. I have well, no... No qualms with, about it. There, there was you, and there was uh, what was that thing that became? There was the Groove Tube. Remember the Groove Tube? Well, the Groove tube? tube was my friend Steve Gruber, another my probably one of my best friends who died a couple of years back. 
Uh, and and those were, and then there was, uh, and then I came out here and there was Video West, and yeah. I'm sure there were many other collectives in uh, Actually, New York. Actually, I, I worked with Video West. Yeah. Yeah, I did uh, the, the MTV stuff with them. I was on MTV. This is a great story. I was M on MTV for the first year of its life, okay, doing reports as a reporter for uh, MTV News. But really what it was, I sat in an announce booth, and I was the L.A. reporter. Never went to L.A., but I just narrated these clips, right? Mm -hmm. This is Alex Bennett from Los Angeles or Hollywood, you know. And then blah, 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 and then they would show, the video would be shown. And um, uh, this thing called MTV, so they auditioned me for it uh, over at Video West, and that was the last I heard of it. So now I my, bit, my boss at... Uh, Live 105 said, hey, listen, uh, Ed, his name was Ed Cramp. Let's go down to, to uh, San Jose tonight. They're going to be premiering a new thing. They're going to start showing it down there called MTV, and they, they're having a, a rollout party. So I go to the rollout party, and they then they say, okay, we want you all to gather around, and we're going to show you a clip of what MTV is all about. And they show this clip of MTV, and in the middle of it, hi, this is Alex Bennett from Hollywood. <laughs> and, so they had used your audition. And every piece? everybody turns around and looks at me and says, <laughs> "You work for this new MTV?" And I said, "I guess I do now." <laughs> and did they you? Uh, what? Uh, I think did I got pay? like a stipend, like thirty-five bucks a clip or whatever. Uh, but um, I then they gave, uh, I called them and I said, what happened? I mean, all of a sudden I'm in this clip and they said, oh yeah, we forgot to tell you, we're hiring you to be the Los Angeles guy. <laughs> so, our Hollywood guy. So, um, for the first year, I'm on MTV. And then they decide, they drop the whole Video West thing of supplying clips. They figure they'll do it themselves. They'll do MTV news themselves. Uh, and I think they even had a news reporter by the name of Matt Lauer they were going to use. OK, uh, and they dropped it about the time that MTV wound up in San Francisco. And every time I tell the story that I was on MTV for its first year, nobody believes me that I was there. The, I was on the air the first day MTV ever went on. Wow. Yeah. And wow. Nobody, but nobody believed me because I wasn't on anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That was my. Didn't didn't you also uh, be the first human to uh, step onto the uh, uh, the astroturf? Yes, astroturf. Astro yeah, yeah. People yeah. people used to kid me about that. I just the, we were. I was. Um, this was Houston, Texas. I can't remember the year now. Uh, God, I, uh, it had to be sometime between oh sixty five and. Uh, well, yeah. When I go to New York, I went 60, to New York. 68, yeah. I was in New York in the 70s. Uh, so I was about 68 or something what like that. What was your name? Uh, I was doing James Bond at the time. <laughs> and, and they... Uh, 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 Did you get away with that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I got away with it better than the guy who was really British up in Dallas doing the same thing. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. They, they uh, the British consul would invite me over to see them and so on. And I, it was so Houston and Dallas both. Yeah. Had well, when I got the job, I got the job auditioning with a British accent, and uh -huh. then they said we want to hire you. And I said, well, I have something to tell you. And they said, what? And I said, I'm not British. <laughs> and. Uh, I mean, there's a whole backstory about how they got a hold of me through my father, who said, "Do you know this guy named Percy McGuire? That was the name I used, the Liverpool Lip. I called myself <laughs> and, Percy and, in my in my audition. Yeah, and I said, yes, I do. And they said, you know where we can find him? I said, you're talking to him. And they said, you know, you're not British. And I said, no. They said, could you be? I said, sure. Could you be all the time? What do you mean? Well, if we bring you into Houston, we don't want anybody to know you're not British. So I had to every time in real life? every time I left the house, I had to be British for a year or a year and a half, <laughs> something like that. And, and 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 the best part about this story is a few years later in, okay. <laughs> I love this. A few years later in, 
uh, I started, I realized that my life being the British guy on radio was going the way of all flesh. You know, I mean, come on, enough is enough. So I start slowly losing my accent to the point where I'm not even using it. Hi, this is James Bond, you know. And some people would come to me and say, you know, you're losing your English accent a bit. Because <laughs> I was from California, and to a Texan, that's a British accent, you know. But anyway... Uh, so I took the job, and I was just British all the time, you know, and I would come home to my wife and say, hello, dear, how are you? And and she would say, you're home, cut it out, <laughs> you know. And this, after a while, being this dual thing really drove me crazy because even my friends had to think I was British. I mean, this was the deal I made with the Gordon right. McClendon organization exactly. that I wouldn't let anybody know I wasn't British. And the For station was KILT, so I came up with the slogan, James Bond, Agent 008, with a license to kilt. <laughs> anyway, that's my... But enough about me and my so, history. So how'd you get on the, the Astrodome? Uh, oh, the, oh, we were going for AstroTurf, weren't we? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dee Dee Hoffines, who was the daughter of Judge Roy Hoffines, who owned the Astros and owned the Astrodome, um said, we're having a little gathering at the Astrodome. Would you like to come? And I said, sure. She said, well, I'll put your name on the list. And I go there. And what, they're do what they were doing is they said, see, they had a problem because they built this dome and they built it with skylights up above. But they were on this grid. And so when the ball went up into the air, they couldn't see it to catch it. it would, they would just be in this maze of lattice work and so on. It was very hard to see. So they had to solve that problem. So they, they painted over the windows on the top of the Astrodome. They covered them. That it's solved the, the problem, but it caused, the it caused another problem. The grass died. Yeah, so yeah. they went over to Monsanto and said, have you got an answer for this? He said, well, we got this thing we're working on called AstroTurf or something turf. And they said, well, but if you call it AstroTurf, we'll put it in here. And it was the first place to ever have an artificial field so uh and it, it, i remember it it was kind of like walking on a very hard rug yeah <laughs> you know but they had to have special cleats for it all of that you know lost a lot but, of knees a lot of ball players but the reason lost was the of... the astrodome and the reason they built the astrodome was because it gets so unrelentingly hot in houston texas during the summer and humid and of course baseball is a summer game that they by having a, a dome stadium uh, it was very comfortable to watch baseball, so it was. So that was that. Hit. Hey, let's get down to stuff. Come on, you're the political. Of the world. You're, you're the political guy. Is there any news out there? Uh, <laughs> the the Mueller report as big a disappointment as Y2K. Yes, Comet <laughs> Kohutek. <laughs> Al, Al Capone's vault. Right. Howard the Duck. Yep. Uh, Michael Jordan's baseball career. <laughs> See? I could go on. Yeah, you could go on and on. Um, yeah, we were all, I, I kind of described it as the next day after this happened, after it went down, uh, I kind of felt uh, like it was the day after the last election. It kind of had that same dreary quality to it. Oh my God, he's still president, you know. Um, I I kind of felt that there maybe wasn't going to be any indictment of him directly, but it sure made me kind of mad that uh, that you know they allowed uh, Bill uh, William, is it Bill Barr um, to uh, state his opinion of what the rest of it meant right a four-page summary of a thousand page maybe more yeah we don't know how long the report is yeah uh, tell it. and and if supposedly Apparently he read the whole thing all 2800 pages he read the whole thing and summarized it in 48 hours yeah well he also supposedly he got the word from Mueller that he was he, he wasn't he was pretty sure on the rest of the counts but as far as uh, you know, uh, obstruction of justice, 
He just, he couldn't find the proof that there was, but he couldn't find the proof that there wasn't. Okay. Yeah. He said this does not exonerate him. This does not exonerate him. So it was up to Barr to decide whether he would be exonerated. And Barr, of course, is Trump's guy. So he just said, well, we're not, you know, it's not obstruction of justice either. That's my decision to make. Okay. But uh, it, that part of it is still very murky, you know, about obstruction of justice. But, you know, my feeling the is... Thing is murky. I mean, they had what? They had 500... Uh, I got it here. I got it here because I wrote it. Uh, shut up. Uh, come on. Uh, damn computer. Yeah. Uh, there were uh, 675 days, 19 lawyers, 40 FBI agents, 500 search warrants, 2,800 subpoenas, 13 requests to foreign governments for evidence. And that was that was what they got. Really? I could have gotten more. Yeah, I, I could have gotten more just reading the newspaper. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I find it, I mean, you know, what it was is Mueller, I think, felt that he had to have irrefutable proof that some things had happened and it was still too murky to find him guilty on or uh, that they were involved in the in the in the election that way. OK, so that's all I'm saying, you know, Um but I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know how you feel about it. But you know, I was very, I was dis, I, I was disappointed. Obviously, I huh? I, I can't think about it. I can't. I, it, yeah, I'm gonna punt to the Southern District of New York. Yeah, yeah. Who, who? They can find something. Who yesterday decided rather than go after Trump, they went after Michael Avenatti. Yeah, didn't that sound suspicious? Suddenly, all Trump's enemies are being rounded up. <laughs> well, I don't know. That, that was the 8th district, district Court and then another court out in L.A. with a separate charge of wire fraud. So I don't think it had to do with the president saying, now go get him. But what got me today, and, and, and this is uh, uh, interesting, the White House is asking for an investigation into the investigation. <laughs> In other words, they want another special counsel to look at the investigation of the special counsel. And if, if that if he doesn't get the result that he wants from that, he'll investigate an investigator to investigate the investigative investigation. I, exactly, and and but that also investigatively also that the White House wants to get even. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, he wants to get even. And that's that's okay. I understand that because he's a vindictive little piece of shit. No, if you try to kill the king, make sure you, you're successful. You don't you don't take a shot at the king and then walk away. Yeah, yeah. So anyway. You got to kill the king. Yeah, so you got to kill the king. But the, f the fact is that he, he wants to go after these people. And my feeling is, I, I seem to remember like when Clinton, when they went after impeachment on Clinton and all of that and special counsel, the whole thing, okay, that when it was all over, Clinton said, okay, now let's just all get together and let's get on and, you know, move this country forward. You didn't hear that from Trump. There was nothing like, uh, it was rather, an, oh, these people were out to get me and blah, 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 rather than, okay, it's all over now. Let's move ahead with the business of the country and let me allow me to try and get the business done. That would have been the speech to give, but he didn't. Because he's the Oval Office Oompa Loompa. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 well, he has no class. That's for damn sure, you know. No. Uh, and, and, and his and it, this whole thing has been striving to make sure, to rub it in the noses of that New York uh, establishment, that that the Manhattan establishment that never accepted the the kid from Queens, he always felt like he had been miffed and rebuffed, and and he wasn't part of the the cool kids. And now he's going to stick it. Uh, the cool kids stick their face in the mud, yeah. however he can. Yeah, and um, uh, I think that this would be a time for him to do a rallying speech you know, and say, let's now all move forward the, with the business of the country and let me do my job, you know, but that's what he should do, you know, 
that that's the perfect position. Now, where did where should the Democrats be? I think they should just lay off this whole thing, not have any false hopes they're going to find something in the Mueller report, and just move on and talk about the business of what the Democrats want to do if they take over. You know, I think they should get his tax re- uh, returns. <laughs> you think they should still keep going after him? Yeah. Just like the Republicans kept going after Benghazi. Remember that? How many hearings were held on Benghazi? Do you remember? Uh, uh, thousands? Over 50. over 50? 50 hearings. Over 50 hearings on Benghazi. So you just keep it in the in the <laughs> public and let the public know. And don't, don't get cowed when they say, oh... Oh, you can't. Uh, you, you won't give it up. So what? I can't remember who the who the, uh, who the uh, ambassador was who went to Benghazi, and then was killed. I'm trying to remember his name now, but they never brought up a big part of that whole story. Is that he was told by the United States government not to go to Benghazi, that it was a dangerous they thing. Protect him there, yeah. They couldn't protect him there, but he went anyway. So what are you blaming Hillary for? Blame him. He's responsible for the death of what the other four people that were with him, or three people. I can't remember how many the number was. Yeah, yeah. It was, I think it was three. I yeah. think it was four died. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he he was told not to go. He was told it was a bad idea, but he went anyway. You know. So uh, you follow the the GOP template. You just uh, uh, bang, bang, bang. Just yeah. keep it going. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I've lived longer than you have, and I've lived longer than most years. people listening to this broadcast are, uh, have lived. And uh, in my time, people say, well, gee, it, it, this is the worst it's ever been, right? And I say, not really. You know, it's the worst president we've ever had. I mean, let's face it. I don't care if this thing vindicated him, if he was the, if if it said you didn't do anything, he's still a fucking prick. He's still an asshole. He does not comport himself as a president should comport himself. All right? So that being said, the fact of the matter is, have I ever seen it worse? And I got to say that when I went through the 50s, with the House Un-American Activity Subcommittee, I think that was worse. I think that was actually terrible. I mean, if we ever lost our uh, sense of being an American, it was during that period of time, you know. This is just a gaffe and a guy running the country who is taking us to ruin, but this isn't the kind of erosion of our moral fiber in this in this country that it was back then we still have an erosion of our moral fiber now (laughs) you know i would rather not be an american i would rather be from some other country uh because i i just think americans have turned into horrible people in the eyes of the world and in my eyes but back then the 50s were pretty terrible it's pretty damn ugly. I mean, when you bring somebody up in front of a committee, say, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And if you say you refuse to testify because you don't think it's their right to ask, all of a sudden the next day you don't have a job anymore and you don't work for the next 10 years. Now, that was pretty terrible. You know, you compare that to what we have today. Sure, today is terrible because you didn't live back then. But post-war United States was terrible, just terrible. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't know. Pretty much the whole world. Pretty much the whole and world. And also, uh, the 20th century was fucked. I mean, the First World War mm-hmm. was five years, 1914, 1918. Mm-hmm. And then 20 years later, you know, the well, Second World War. The Second World War. Years. By the way, the First World War, when it was happening, was never known as the First World War. It was the Great War. It was the Great War because there was no Second World War. No, now so we they called didn't a, have to say, yeah. they did, we didn't have to start numbering them. Right. They would just be great or terrific or wonderful or uh, <laughs> great war. unbelievable, you know. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, no. Uh, and and we, we went, when we went to war in World War II, we went with a pretty moral purpose, okay? More so than World War I certainly more so than the Korean War and even more so than the Vietnam War. What happened after World War II, we felt that we did a wonderful thing. 
And then we felt like, hey, let's go pick some more wars and do a wonderful thing. And we had this image of ourselves that quickly got eroded by going into wars we shouldn't be going into. So Two in a row. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, when I was growing up, it wasn't the greatest time you could think of, you know. And then when you go to the Vietnam War period, that was even worse. So today is a different kind of horrible, you know, and deplorable. And uh, it is deplorable. The man is deplorable. I mean, he's just a fucking piece of shit. Is that? I never thought I'd say that about a president. I, you know, because oh. the president was always this kind of leader we had. Yeah. Even yeah, Nixon, yeah. I called him Tricky Dick, but that was about it. I didn't call him a piece of shit. Well, we hadn't had this uh, this template for our, ourselves before. Yeah, yeah. Hey, so uh, anyway, so there's that, and oh, uh, Jesse Small, Jesse Smollett just got off. They dropped, I don't understand. They dropped that. the charges against him. I don't understand that. I don't understand it either. But you he know. lied. He lied to the cops. I think what happened here. Remember that speech the chief of police or whatever of Chicago, yeah, Chicago. gave, saying how guilty he was. I think that played into it. I think they said we can go after you on that. You know, and they just wanted to get out of the way of being called racist and all of that, and so they just settled. You know. They, there's no no uh, community service time. There's no uh, probation or anything like that. He's off. He's just exonerated. He he didn't wasn't charged. Right. So he didn't have to plead to anything. He right. didn't have to. Yeah. Right. So it, it that 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 was kind of an interesting. So let's see if his career stalls or dives or shoots. Well, you know? we'll, we'll see what happens. Hey, well, listen, uh, as always, our time has run out. And as always, this has been just a wonderful time spent with you, Wilders, because I, I really and enjoy you, it. you, Alex Bennett. I learned so much. Well, and you I, learned I, so I, much. A little brief time together every three weeks. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, thanks for having me, and uh, I hope we get to do it again. Ladies and gentlemen, from San Francisco, California, show them out the window. Show them out the window. It's nice today. From Oh. From San Francisco, California. There we are. There's our final shot of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, Will Durst. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Alex Bennett.